We are back. 11 o'clock here in the Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern Time, post this day 2024. A little bit of topic with flip last year. We're going to go from the uh, very, very fine grain details of programming to zoom way back out to the big picture, uh, writing the sequel, revising the framework of cities with our repeat post this day friend, Bonnie McLean. Bonnie, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good to see All you. All right. Again. Giddy yeah. up, my friends. <laughs> are you ready to go? Yes. Thank you. All right. Here we go. So, you know, why the cities, right? Cities are this holistic framework for analyzing the broader national metabolism because 80% of global GDP is produced through the city. So this is like a day in the life. This is kind of what I do as a quantitative storyteller because we have to remember that the stethoscope doesn't do the diagnosing. <laughs> it's the physician, it's the professional. So we have to be present. And so I talk about urban metabolism, material flow analysis, input output analysis, whatever it is that you call it or you might call it. This is why I, how I access the data and why SQL and databases are so important to me. I contextualize and present intensity and these extent metrics through this urban metabolism. You see the output, you see the production. These are all variables that we have to put. We need to actually detail the inner workings of the system, looking at the exchanges of flows between them. And that is what I do and how I use census data and other data. We'll get to that. But now we're still looking at the input, the output, the waste, the energy. These are all systems where we generate our variables between the different sectors of the economy. You can see here, a lot of you might identify with some of these buckets of information that you study, that you're interested in, you know, the human aspect, climate, which is my specialty, agriculture, energy redistribution. You know, I just like this picture because it's butter and who doesn't love butter? This thing is so teeny, teeny, tiny, but in the lower right corner, that's kind of where I work around the fossil fuel energy materials side. But this is such a great video for geospatial folks and geospatial thinking because it's so dense with all the stuff that drives our communities and our national metabolism. For the first time in history, global human-made mass exceeds living biomass. All our junk is now one teraton. And, and growing, which is outpacing our living biomass. So this idea of grow, grow, grow is not sustainable. Energy consumption increases by 63%. We get more efficient at the rate of 36%. You can do the math on that one. And you can see the tiny little wind, solar, nuclear, renewable part. And when we deal with fiat currency, there's nothing backing it up. It's basically a petrol dollar. And that's part of the problem because we can just write more dollars. If you look to the lower right corner, the value of the dollar is diminished because we need more money. We don't have anything standing behind it. We just raise the debt. And that's why we're in a constant struggle for materials. And this right here is the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here's where we get like 75% of the world's cobalt comes through here. And you can see the devastation. And it's not just in the pits, it's in the soil. All of the Anthropocene is represented there. We exceed the planetary boundaries, three more, uh, and we're all, we're done. <laughs> you know, so we have to be mindful of bringing more energy to the equation without doing proper indexing and looking at our nuclear, you know, our resource capital, because we. This is really interesting. This is Kleiber's law. You would expect this linear relationship between metabolism and body mass, but it's actually sublinear. We're very efficient. The bigger we get, look where we are compared to the elephant. You know, but if you put in our external use of electronics and everything, we're 100x. We are the equivalent of 12, 10 to 12 elephants. And think about the waste they would bring if each of us was 10 elephants. So we have to be really mindful of the energy we're using and demanding and how we are now becoming, we're moving off the scale. We're not as energy efficient as we become bigger. Now we're becoming super linear. We have unbounded growth. 
And I wanted to put this slide in because these are the kinds of things I listen to. This is from the London School of Economics. And I wanted to find a way to look at industrialization. So these are some of the metrics I used in a study that I'm doing, looking at carbon emissions, capita, primary energy consumption, non-agriculture, um, employment. And this is where I kind of started creating databases. And I, this is just a little peek of where you can find all these different types of data. And I focus primarily on the census because you can find so much categorical information, scare, scaling variables for energy are really important. So now we're going to switch into maybe what you're a little used to seeing, the uh, kind of boots on the ground. I think we're familiar with Postgres. We have um, installation instructions. I think we're all there. You know, you can use it through uh, QGIS, which is kind of, what I do, but you set it up right on your screen, right on your canvas. It's pretty easy peasy, but if you have, if you need some help getting you there, um, that's fine. You know, census data as a rule is, it's kind of funky. I mean, I've been using it for decades, so I can find my way around it. I know a lot of these tables by heart, the numbers and where to go, and I don't even bother changing them, but you know, it's you have to be familiar with what's here, but it is a treasure trove. If you look in that bottom left, I scrolled to pass for it when I recorded it, but there's industry data there, there's supply chain, there's energy, all of these things in different, you know, government instruments that we are using. And you can download, and a lot of it's geospatial. A lot of it is that important layer that you need to put on top of your data when you're asking the question, why here? What is it that I'm looking at? What do these patterns mean? How do I interpret the semantic layer or how do I create the semantic layer? This is kind of what I do as a quantitative storyteller, but we all can do these things when we want to, we don't want to just think with words, right? Because then you could just say anything. You have to think with facts. Otherwise, I could tell you we're all going to Mars and you could believe me, but, you know, as a bench scientist, we're not going anywhere. That'll be the most tragic reality show ever when the spaceship lands and they open the door. So, um, you know, this is my introduction of just kind of looking at the census and it's, it's technical and, you know, how... How do you get to this data? How do you pull this in? You know, how do you create your base maps? How do you move forward and use this valuable information? Here's information about those supply chain tables. You know, you can look at plant capacity, importing and exporting companies. And if you talk about cities the way I do, and you look at urban metabolism, this is gold. But I suggest census reporter as more of a gateway because it's more user friendly. You can look at it right now and you probably are already exhaling. You know, the tension is coming out of your hands as you looked at the other <laughs> the other uh, website. You can talk to it in a, you know, a, a normative way to find out some of your data questions or to create those data questions because how do we get from the raw data to, you know, how the columns talk to each other and how the user is going to be using the information we provide. It's all about the semantic layer. So when we look here, we see these types of housing units, we have vacancy rates, all of this information, we can pull it right into QGIS through the database manager, which you, know, you can see on the left, I have my schema created, where I put buckets for different types of information because in SQL, it's so great that you can actually interact with it in a way where you can connect different schema. So I try to keep things organized that way. People do it differently. If I wanna talk about the boroughs, I picked Manhattan because I'm in Geography 2050, speaking at Columbia tomorrow. So I've been using a lot of New York data and you know you set it up right there on the left in the um, the browser window on QGIS. I'm an open source person, so it's QGIS all day, every day. But I'm sure there's uh, ways to use this in whatever your uh, platform of choice is. And you can see how this is set up here. I have 
my Postgres database with all these schemas loaded inside of it. And I'm trying to see, I recorded this, but then I decided I wanted to be live with you. But if you look, you can kind of see the different types of data types there. I have the census loaded in its own area because often that layer is what comes after, after you build out the topography, after you build out the location, uh, you know, you import the vectors. So I'm a Mac OS person. So all of my data gets imported through QGIS into my um, PostGIS, you know, my system, my database. And it, it's pretty easy to do. It's pretty, um, for the most part, pretty straightforward. But, you know, you have to label things. You have to identify which schema it's in. You can use the public schema for everything. That could just be one thing. It does simplify your code. But, you know, for an organizational perspective, and I'm always moving between environments and talks, I like to keep it like this because I know where my building footprints are. And we're going to come back to these building footprints um, in just a little bit. But you can also look at your data. Is it populating the way I think it is? Is it a complete data set? You know, often you pull things in and things look a little funky. You'd rather find that out before you start coding. It's just like really simple code telling you that it's in this database. This is the data I want to look at. And I want to look at income of $200,000 or more. So once you get, you know, the the swing of SQL, I prefer it to chat GPT uh, also as a uh, alternate voice or information because I know what this is accessing. There's no black box as to where the data is coming from. And you can actually look across the bottom and what you see in the first numbered column is all of Manhattan. And then all the other columns are talking about different tracks, different census tracks. So if you had a specific track or a specific area, that's where you could dive deeper in. You see the one, you can see the column headings here, and this is where you develop your question. You know, the BBL is uh, borough, block, and, you know, a uh, lot. So, you know, you can really zoom in on these places. You have a lot of granularity. I'm looking at total carbon emissions, and I'm trying to find out which of these property uses are generating the highest carbon emission because remember you know working at the local city level allows us to expand that knowledge to the broader national metabolism and to see where we could you know perturb the system and improve and um, reduce carbon emissions and you know try to contribute to a more sustainable environment in our local cities so you see all the data that's included here. I scrolled across so you could see the energy units. Sometimes you have to see how complete the data set is. You know, you can clean it up first to see where the missing data is, how you want to manage the missing data that might influence how you frame your data question. And that's important too, because we have to have some familiarity with the data that we're using. You can rename these. I should have. I I will out myself as probably the sloppiest SQL coder when it comes to naming things. It's very easy to go in, make everything lowercase, make it simple for yourself. But because I use it across so many different projects, I try to keep it as original as possible. And here's a glimpse into my canvas. You know, I convert it that um, total carbon, the emissions and the energy into a heat map. So I can look across Manhattan and see where the energy hogs are and make me ask some bigger questions. And, you know, my data is all living right here and I can access it. And there, you can decide on your base map how much information you want to bring into the conversation. But, you know, I, I, I love looking at heat maps because it's telling me where I might focus. I'm also now putting those multifamily housing units on top of the heat map trying to see the clustering because, you know, I can go into these multifamily housing units and say something, you know, more specifically because I have, if I, let me, let, let me tell you what this is first. These are the tracks with that $200,000 plus income. So we're trying to see, you know, what are they using the energy for? So you can kind of come in and layer those buckets that you created in your schema and ask these questions. And we can look at energy grade. I just picked the goodies and the baddies. So we can just kind of see, you know, is there a pattern? You know, we see 
Um, you know, you can ask SQL bigger questions. You know, what areas have the most energy grade C or D? These are things we can just write into our query and then populate the canvas. And that's what you're seeing here. You're not seeing me write the code. You're seeing me execute it and, you know, show you the results of it. So once again, those big colored polygons are census tracts. And, you know, I, I layer this all the time. I, you can turn things off. Here's the building footprints that, you know, everyone's so hot for. Um, but, you know, I find that that data is a little limited. So uh, I'm going to show you, I go to FEMA and I use the structural because it has a lot more information that I need if I'm going to be querying uh, my data to say these quantitative stories, to talk about energy, to talk about communities, to talk about this holistic framework I was talking about, because we're talking about energy, we're talking about climate science, and we have a lens now at the city level to be able to explore that. So you're looking at those two colored polygons are actually those census tracts where the people make over $200,000. Let me see where we're going here. <laughs> I'm looking, to, I'm watching my little cursor click, like what was I thinking? Uh, it, it'll, it'll pass through, but I want you to notice the structures of these buildings here and how you can actually bring these bigger questions to bear when you're looking at specific areas. I, I tend to zoom in. I know the city. This is, you might be able to tell from my accent, this is kind of, you know, where I'm from. So I know if I want to zoom in on this building, if I want to go into this neighborhood, you know, I know a bit of the politic behind it. So we're looking at that higher income area. We're looking at those energy grades. And we can also do that over in PG Admin 4, which is usually where I start because it's so much easier for me to mess up the code over here than it is to mess it up over there in, in QGIS. I like, you know, it's extra. You don't need to have this on your computer, your local computer. But I find if I want to manage my database, I like to do it over here and play around and I have all those functions, which I didn't show you, but once you add the Postgres extension, you know, you're, it's, it's off to the races with all the things you can do. So I created this database specifically for the conversation we're having right now. So there's a lot of things you can explore in here. What you're looking at here is the geometry viewer. Uh, it doesn't really give you anything here. But it's often interesting when you write your SQL, if you got like a bazillion data points, um, you know, because we, we collect a lot of data, right? You know, we, you can't measure what we don't collect. But, you know, sometimes when we write our code, we want to make sure it's applying what we think it should be applying. So we want to kind of see that data set become more refined and more specialized. So this is the um, energy and water. We're looking at, you know, the... Uh, energy water with the building energy. So now we have a nestled, this table is inside that schema and we want to look and see what we're looking at. And we're going to look at this in its table iteration. I'm um, shortly, I'm just showing you, you know, how these schema are related, how they're set up. And, you know, they look prettier over here, don't they? So I, I like, you know, I do better over in PG Admin than I do, than I do in QG. Sometimes I'm just writing something so fast that it comes out beautifully and I don't want to go back and clean it up. So my, my goal is to just write it clean from the beginning, because if you do everything lowercase, you don't need the quotes and all that stuff. So, you know, and plus, you know, when I'm using a Mac, I have to bring the data all in on the QGIS side and then I can see it here. You just hit refresh and everything updates across. So everything is synced beautifully you can write your code in one, you can write it in the other, you can run this, you know, I had to run this in Docker for, there was some sort of a conference I was speaking at where they couldn't have things on their computer, so we had to run everything in these little Dockers. So, you know, there's lots of utility and use for this. And now, you know, and I just showed you, I, I spoke over it, but if you open, you can open up a table while you're working and you can actually see 
the table right here. You can see the columns, right? Because the columns are what we need to work with, right? We're looking at how these columns relate to each other. That's really the definition of a semantic layer. Like, what do we know from borough block and lot in a census file? But what's important about working with some of this data is if you can connect it to bigger data sets. And in, in the census world, what we're able to do in New York structures, this is what I'm showing you here, is we actually have a FIPS column. If any of you work with census data, you're all like clapping loudly and jumping around because this FIPS connector means you can join the structures data to some much bigger questions. And I like this because I use a lot of, you know, measuring square footage to look at, you know, infrastructure density. And that information lives in those FEMA files. And if you go to the FEMA website and look around, there's a lot of data there for you to access. So just like I said, the stethoscope doesn't do the diagnosing. It's important to also know where to get this data that you can access to ask your data questions. And so when you look here in the building energy, this is an example that geom, to, you need to have that geom you know, column or you're not gonna um, see anything location wise, but you can see when buildings were built, you can see where exactly where they're located, lots of address data. I like the primary use of the buildings. I like you know um, the square footage. I like where they're located. And when you're doing these big, you know, analytic projects, you know where you can kind of scale back. Maybe you just want to look at multifamily. Maybe you want to just look at commercial. Maybe you want to look at buildings at a higher square footage, lower square footage. That sort of thing can be done when you're looking in these sorts of tables. And there's just a lot of information here. You can look at occupancy. You can look how the energy is metered. You know, I know I'm spe if I'm speaking to people that like look at energy and look at climate science and you like to do it at the city level, I mean, 80%, like I said, of the global GDP comes in the city. So we have to monitor it there. Here you can see electricity use per square foot, total square footage. You can see what the property is used for. You can see their average use and you can look at it at that block borough lot level. So, I mean, I just think this is brilliant. Look how simple the code is. I mean, it's not, if you know SQL, it's not that fantastical, right? I mean, it's just really, I find it to be very uh, natural in how you speak. You know, I wrote a, I wrote a book on Python. And then um, when I wrote the book on SQL, I was like, oh my God, this is so much easier that, you know, I want more people to be able to, um, to be able to do that sort of thing. So now you can look across there, you can see, you know, I think that looking at how the data is set up is so important because there's a lot like height, the shape, you know, these are all things you can look at when you want to look at morphometrics, you know, how are cities designed? When I look at that plot of buildings or structures, what is it that I can say? What am I saying about how these buildings are used? And if I'm going to layer it with census information, like income, education, you know, I can start making conversations and do that quantitative storytelling from a place of knowledge and expertise. That is, this is your income level that you're looking at here. And then you're looking at the margins of error. So whenever you see the error, and there's usually a ton of these per track, I just simplified it to look at Manhattan, basically, but you can do this anywhere. But I also think it's important to know the governance of your data, the stock of materials down there. That's the stock of all the materials in Manhattan. I know it flashed by. This is the energy slide that you all have to like put to memory. It is fascinating, especially when you look at the bottom and you see how little we use these renewables that the headlines are about. They're going to save our bacon. They're the way of the future. But, you know, not necessarily. We just don't have the capacity to match what we need in petroleum, natural gas, and coal. That's what I mean. Like, you can't just think with words. You can't just say, 
we're going to save the world with solar. Well, are we? Because I don't know about you, but I need my glasses to see the little solar, tiny, tiny little Sankey thing. I mean, would I love it to be bigger and better? Sure, absolutely. Is it? Are we at capacity? No. Can we get closer to capacity? We can do better than we're doing, but I'm not going to you know, uh, think the earth and the world is going to be saved by, you know, putting out some solar and nuclear. We have this huge petroleum uh, addiction to, to work our way through. And, you know, even if you leave gasoline, you can't leave gasoline in the ground. So even if we all have electric vehicles, if you need oil for diesel, you know, and this is my way of saying, even though you, you may not believe that the asteroids are coming, but, you know, if they're coming, you know, not knowing about them doesn't mean they're not going to come. And so that's, you know, I, I like this E.O. Wilson quote, destroying the rainforest for economic gain is like burning a Renaissance painting to cook a meal. You know, I, I'm not anti-AI. I'm not anti-technology. I'm like, how about we just do the accounting? And we could stop here and see if there's any questions. I have a Sequel in the city, free little Substack because I feel like Sequel just doesn't get the love that it deserves. So I write little articles here, and occasionally we have little chats and we, um, you know, share our little Sequel. And I like the Sequel in the city kind of play there. Cool. Well, I have a I have a quick question, which okay. is um, so you're out there, you're spreading the good word of Sequel to the world. Um, like, like, who are you talking to these days? Like, who, who are you, who are you giving the good learnings of sequel to? You're like, who cares? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm invited to speak. Uh, you know, I, I speak at some universities. I speak at conferences. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm kind of laughing and I, I don't hope I don't offend anyone in the audience, but like, I always have these great, the one I'm doing for Geography 2050 is, you know, really important. It's about like, accounting natural resource capital accounting and i get put at the little lightning talk on the side you know because i'm like the i'm like the killjoy you know i'm not i'm not picking up the pom-pom saying go ai we can do everything i'm like yeah slow down so yeah I'm, I, I do a lot of that i do a lot of workshops a lot of the quantitative storytelling applies to a lot of data work we're all doing and people want to know how to do it more effectively where to find the data. And that's why I rely on SQL so much because I think you can get out of the gate on SQL, you know, in a few hours versus I think the Python environment is a little more challenging uh, to get that um, learning curve going. You, uh, do you see any SQL fear? I mean, a lot of people shy away from programming of any sort. Does it, does it go over? Uh, yeah, yes, because I think it's very dangerous to not know, even if you're just doing low code, you don't know what you're doing when you hit that button. I mean, that to me, that is the worst. And I'm not saying you have, I don't write code necessarily. I'm not a programmer. I know the skills. I can read the stack. You know, I'm, I'm also, you know, at the top, you know, I'm at the later stage of my career. I've done all that stuff. So now I'm trying to, uh, get people to understand the power of the data that they're already using and generating. That's awesome. And and you find that, you know, do they, they get enough leverage from learning the basics from you to prime the learning pump and, and want to keep learning more? Oh, absolutely. From the quantitative storytelling, once they can understand what it is, you know, and how to build it into whatever their data model is, which isn't necessarily climate science, it becomes very powerful because you get those little aha moments and people are like, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, Bonnie, I want to thank you for joining us again this year. It's been a pleasure. Oh, always fun. Thanks, guys, for having me. Elizabeth, thanks for all your work getting this up and running for me.